Now, when we talk about the IT Act in particular, this initially they had only three fold objective. One was the legal recognition for e transactions to facilitate electronic filing of documents with government agencies and three to amend the certain acts such as the IPC and Evidence Act and other acts. Now, what, what is there today when we look at the IT Act the objectives and these three objectives are not the only objectives. I feel that there is a lot more that the IT Act does. It gives out a clear cut paraphernalia for setting up a regulatory regime to supervise for instance the certifying authorities lays down what are the offenses, what are the civil wrongs or the contraventions that are to be governed by the IT Act. It also lays down the legal recognition of electronic documents and digital signatures. Now, they are very crucial for the purposes of cyber security. In order to securely transact any, any communication with anybody or transact any business online, it is very important for an email to be secure and for that purpose the secure electronic documents or records are very very important in order to ensure the authenticity of that communication is maintained the particular email is coming from that source only and not anyone else and therefore there is a provision there are provisions under IT Act which define what is a secure electronic record or a document. Normally, we use a PKI system here, which is the public key infrastructure system, which ensures there is a private key and a public key and both correspond e to each other algorithmically, such that when one is used to sign, the other public key is used to decrypt it. Whatever is encrypted can be decrypted only with the corresponding key that creates security that ensures the authenticity of that communication is maintained. Now, apart from the main features as I was in, in fact uh, discussing, there are, there are also other important provisions such as jurisdiction for instance, section 75 of the IT Act. It clearly specifies that this particular offense committed under this act, even if committed by a person who is outside India of any nationality, but the effect of that crime is felt on a computer system within India will be held liable under the IT Act 2000. Now, there were need for amendments, there were definitely need for amendments long ago when this act was enacted in 2000, from then on in 2008 there have been many amendments. The 2008-9 amendments are very important from the perspective of cyber security, why I say so? Digital signatures, they were the only method for authentication earlier. Now, the act becomes technology neutral. It talks about electronic signatures and not just digital signatures which are be run by the PKI system. Now, there is also use of wireless technology that was not even incorporated in the definition of computer network earlier which now finds a mention within. There were also diverse kinds of crimes which were percolating uh, and for example, the MMS attacks. Now, MMS attacks which were not even known before the Vazi.com case in India came to be uh, the highlight and there was need for amendments and therefore, the diversifying nature of cyber crimes led to various amendments. Video voyeurism, which was not a part of the act. Now, section 66 E clearly, it clearly prohibits circulation or creation of any such videos, which capture the private parts of any, for, for example, a woman and that is circulated online, that is invading her privacy and that amounts to a crime. There were other new provisions which have been added by the act uh, in the amendments of 2008 and we will be discussing this subsequently, but for the time being I have been discussing the need for amendments. There was a need to increase the power to investigate and therefore, 
the earlier the power was only with DSP and above. Now it lies with inspector and above rank. And also the interception or the decryption powers of the government have been quite enhanced by the amendments of 2008. The definition of communication device has also been added. It clarifies when we say communication device, it will include a phone, a cell phone, right? And also it defines the computer network in a more comprehensive manner, defines a cyber cafe, the intermediary, who is an intermediary, even auction sites or shopping mall sites. There are those sites which are like B2B platforms, B2C platforms. Those, those sites which form or rather uh, become intermediaries, become uh, a sort of a, a portal on which two different parties are communicating with each other, fall to be an intermediary. What is a cyber cafe was also defined and most importantly the term cyber security was defined in the IT Act, Amendment Act under section 2.1 NB as cyber security means protecting information, equipment, devices, computer, computer resource, communication device and information stored therein from unauthorized access, use, disclosure, modification or destruction. Now, if we look at chapter 5 under the Information Technology Act, section 14 in particular, it talks about the secure electronic record. That is where any security procedure has been applied to an electronic record such as the PKI cryptography system or a digital signature for instance and that is deemed to be a secure electronic record from that time when this particular um, verification has been made. Now, if we look at the new cyber crimes which got added under the IT Amendment Act 2008. The computer related offences fall under section 66, the term hacking is not mentioned there, however section 66 scope has been quite enlarged. It covers any unauthorized access, any download of any data, it also covers any kind of uh, you know intrusion into a virus into a particular system, the denial of access attacks and so on and so forth. Sending of offences as false messages under section 66A has now been struck down by the famous Shreya Singhal's case. However, identity theft under section 66C remains. Cheating by personation under section 66D is also there. Violation of privacy under section 66E, cyber terrorism under section 66F, publishing sexually explicit content under section 67A child pornography under section 67B and stolen computer resource under section 66B of the IT Act. Even attempt to commit an offence is punishable, abetment to commit an offence is also punishable and breach of privacy and confidentiality is also punishable offence under the IT Act. What I would like to tell you on this particular slide is that cyber terrorism is a very very wide term, it has been defined in such a way that any attacks on the national defence systems or any protected systems will also fall here. Any automated public infrastructure which is run on electric grids uh, which are computed, those are also affected by some hacking attempts will also fall into a cyber terrorism scope. Now, when we talk about the um, in particular if we talk about child pornography, then that is a punishable offence again 5 year term or more. This is a, 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 there are few sections which are non bailable in nature, cognizable but non bailable. While un, child pornography is non bailable, cyber terrorism here is non bailable and then there are sections like publishing sexually explicit content is also non bailable. There are other sections like simply section 67 which is still bailable and that uh, is up to 3 years of imprisonment. Those sections uh, which give that kind of punishment 
are cognizable but bailable in nature under the IT Act. Now, when we talk about IPC, there may be a lot of sections there. For example, uh, 499 of IPC read with 500 talks about defamation. Now, that section may also apply along with IT Act section in a particular case. For example, if it is a case of a woman whose modesty has been mal, uh, you know outraged by a particular recording of a video which is without her permission and clicked without her permission and then uploaded online can have a right to sue for defamation as well. Now, when she does that obviously, sections of uh, the IT Act section 67 may be 67A, 66E along with IPC uh, you see section 499-500 get applicable to a particular case. So, it depends what is the nature of the case, the acts involved and then what sections could apply, what crimes could emanate out of that particular sections uh, being applicable and what kind of prosecution will have to be made, whether it is a civil uh, remedy that one pursues for compensation or it is a criminal remedy. For criminal remedies, we do not have a special court appointed under the IT Act. However, the normal criminal justice system is uh, used for that particular purpose. When we talk about the civil wrongs, which are contraventions, we will come to those slides, but then contravention is a civil wrong, something like a tort. For example, a person may actually uh, say commit a crime. Uh, with mens rea only with, with a mental intention to commit a crime, but if somebody is with his negligence has caused a loss to some organization to whom he owes a duty to take care and yet it causes the uh, particular organization a loss. The organization can claim compensation for that negligence if it falls under the contravention provisions of the IT Act and such cases will go to the adjudicating authority appointed under the IT Act which grants compensation.